From the dawn of time, the serpent has always been associated with the side of evil. So it's no surprise that in the 80s heyday of good versus evil, quite a number of snake-based villains rose to popularity to battle our favorite heroes. G.I. Joe had Cobra, Mask had Venom, hell, a whole society of serpents tried to take down Captain America. So with all these scaly villains causing havoc for the good guys, the boys in Mattel behind the Masters of Universe thought to themselves, Hey, I think we can do that too. When it comes to almost any cartoon series, one thing is almost always constant. For every hero, there is a villain. The Autobots had the Decepticons, the Ninja Turtles had Shredder, the Thundercats had the Evil Mutants, hell, even Strawberry Shortcake had the Purple Pie Man. But after defeating the same enemy day in and day out from episode to episode, things can get rather stale. So in an effort to keep things interesting, more bad guys are oftentimes added to the punch. This was the case with He-Man. After beating Skeletor over and over again, Mattel decided it was time to add a new bad guy into the mix. First, they introduced the Evil Horde in 1985. But during the time of the Horde's introduction, Mattel was focusing most of their resources on the He-Man spin-off series, She-Ra. As a result, while initially released as part of the He-Man line, the Evil Horde was more popularly known as the main adversary of the Princess of Power and her rebellion. Fortunately, despite Shira's popularity, Mattel wasn't quite done with He-Man and a year later gave him a new enemy of his own. Enter King Hiss and his army of snake men. Now, unlike Skeletor and his evil warriors who covered all types of evils, from evil beast men, evil ninjas to evil uh, lobsters and skunks, King Hiss and his army were more united under a common theme in that they were all snake men, with Hiss himself taking it a step further. While no one would have any trouble recognizing a typical snake man walking down the street given their scaly reptilian looks, King Hiss looked rather plain. In fact, that was his gimmick. He posed as a heroic human-looking warrior in order to lure any unsuspecting victims near. Once they were within striking distance, he would shed his entire upper body to reveal his true form, a body made out of, you guessed it, snakes. Unfortunately, King Hiss's introduction to the toy line came a little too late to save the He-Man franchise. The filmation cartoon ended without Hiss making a single appearance and pretty soon after, the entire toy line was done. So all we got for his backstory was a mini-comic included with the toy and a brief description found at the back of his packaging. Then in 2002, the He-Man franchise was rebooted with a brand new cartoon and toy line featuring inspired updated character designs. And while initially Skeletor received top billing as the main baddie in Season 1 of the cartoon, King Hiss and his Snake Men quickly snatched up the mantle in Season 2. As the story goes, King Hiss actually existed way before the time of He-Man and Skeletor. He was originally the main adversary of He-Man's ancestor, King Grayskull, the original wielder of the Power Sword, and after that, the Council of Elders, which was formed in the wake of Grayskull's death. Oh, and as an interesting historical tidbit, you know Skeletor's headquarters, Snake Mountain? I'll give you one guess on who the original owner of that mountain was. Anyway, after numerous battles, the Council of Elders, with the combined aid of the Cosmic Enforcers led by Zodak, were able to finally defeat Hiss and his army and banish them into an interdimensional prison called the Void, where they remained trapped for centuries. Until they were finally set free in the present day by a disgruntled Skeletor employee, Evil Lin, with the help of a descendant of the Snake Men. But we'll dive into that a little more later on. In the new series, the Snake Men are the beneficiaries of the best character reimaginations, in my opinion. And no one benefits more than King Hiss himself, who is no longer the one trick pony that his toy originally portrayed him as. This time around, he is a powerful sorcerer and a ruthless leader with an affinity for eating his fallen enemies by swallowing them whole. He is also shown to be a more effective leader than Skeletor, whose lackeys serve him out of fear or having nothing better to do. In comparison, Hiss is generous to his men and treats them with respect. And in return, his men serve him with fierce and unwavering loyalty, with every one of them willing to give up their lives for their leader. Hiss sees the Snake Men as the true master race of Eternia and everyone else as food. Throughout the second series of the cartoon, King Hiss and his men wreak havoc on both He-Man and Skeletor. He goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the sorceress of Castle Grayskull and defeats her, permanently scarring her with his magical venom. He also manages to defeat Skeletor and his men and take back Snake Mountain. 
as well as kill off a super-powered ally of Skeletor, Webstore, something never really done in the original Filmation cartoon. Using the ancient artifact at Serpent Crown, he also turns a few of He-Man's closest allies into Snake Men, including his oldest friend Duncan, turning him into Snake Man at Arms. Get it? His most impressive feat though was when he managed to revive their ancient serpent god, Serpos, whose petrified remains turned out to be the gigantic snake coiled around Snake Mountain. In the end, it takes the combined forces of He-Man, the forest elder god Mossman, and cosmic enforcer Zodak to once again defeat his. It's with his defeat that the second season ends and unfortunately, the series itself is cancelled thereafter. Anyway, regardless of the fact that King Hiss was probably one of He-Man's most deadliest enemies, his success can't be solely attributed to him. Aside from a massive snake army at his command, Hiss was surrounded by an inner circle composed of his most special and uniquely powered scaly operatives. So let's move on to Hiss Men. It all starts way back in 1984 as part of the third wave of He-Man action figures. We were introduced to a new villain, the evil master of snakes, Cobra Khan. As part of a group that consisted of Crab Man, a Spider Man, and an Alligator Man, a Snake Man didn't seem all that special. Little did anyone know that this little Snake Man would be the key to opening a door to a whole new world of trouble for He-Man and his heroic warriors. Although he is technically a snake man, Cobra Khan wasn't actually part of King Hiss's original army. As told in the 2002 reboot, Cobra Khan was actually a modern day descendant of the snake men who joined Skeletor's ranks with the ulterior motive of ultimately freeing King Hiss and his army from the void, whose entrance was conveniently located in the depths of Skeletor's headquarters, Snake Mountain. And with the help of Evil Lin, Cobra Khan was eventually successful in freeing King Hiss and the Snake Men and unleashing their destructive forces upon the present day Eternia. Anyway, as I mentioned earlier, a select few more gifted Snake Men formed King Hiss's inner circle. While most of these Snake Men didn't have too much of a backstory or unique personalities as compared to Cobra Khan, I've always loved their individual designs and their collective group, especially when they were reimagined in this particular reboot. First, we have General Ratlor. He had the special ability of extending his neck using his head as a sort of battering ram. Sort of like an evil mechanic crossed with the Ram Man. Oh, and well as per his name, he had a tail that rattled. Despite his lofty position as King Hiss's second in command, his original toy was actually one of the most ordinary looking of the Snake Man in my opinion. Fortunately, his new redesign gave him a more detailed armor, more fitting of his general status. Next, we have Tongue Lashor, whose original toy actually looked more like a salamander, but well, that's beside the point. As his name suggests, he had a really, really long tongue that he used as his main weapon, stunning his foes with a venomous lick. And if that wasn't enough, his updated look sized him up quite considerably. I guess you need a humongous body to house that long, slimy, spiked tongue. Squeeze represented the constrictor portion of the snake family. What he lacked in venom, he more than made up with with his two powerful and massive arms, which he could elongate to snatch up, trap, and basically crush his foes. And while his classic look was pretty straightforward, with each elongated arm ending with a massive gripping hand, for the new cartoon, they were upgraded into fanged snake heads, sporting long black claws on top for good measure. Then we have Snake Face, who basically had the face that only his mother could love. If you don't count the green scaly skin and the fangs, one would say that Snake Face possesses the most human looking mug compared to all his fellow warriors. That is until he unleashes his true power, which consists of sprouting little red serpents from his eyes, mouth, and head and hitting you with his evil gaze, which like the legendary Gorgon Medusa, would cause any enemy unlucky enough to meet his gaze to turn into stone. And to be honest, there really isn't much more you could do to improve on this look. So he basically stayed the same in the reboot. Just a little bit more streamlined. The next two entries were not really Snake Men per se, but I feel they are worth an honorary mention as well. First, we have the previously mentioned Snake Man at Arms. One of He-Man's oldest and closest friends turned Snake Man by his using the ancient artifact called the Serpent Crown. While the effects in the show turned out to be temporary, the writers actually explained that their original intention was to make Duncan's transformation permanent and would carry into the planned but never materialized third season. In fact, despite the show's cancellation, 
Duncan's transformation into a snake man was pretty much made into canon in other He-Man media, including an official action figure of Snake Man at Arms. And secondly is the evil android Blast Attack, who although was originally introduced as another of Skeletor's minions, was actually created by King Hiss, at least according to the mini-comics that came packaged with his toy, and is sometimes lumped into the Snake Man. He basically had the power to explode at will and later reform to explode another day. He was never featured in the original Filmation cartoon nor the rebooted series or toy line in 2002. It was speculated that he was left off the ladder because in today's world, where suicide bombers are a reality, having a character that basically blew himself up would be in very bad taste. And finally, we have a whole bunch of other snake men worth mentioning that originally started off as unused designs for the toy line or fan concepts that eventually became canon thanks to official action figures being released later on down the line. First, we have Fang R. A newer snake man designed by freelance motel artist and Motu fan Axel Jimenez, sporting long enlarged walrus tusk-like fangs, hence the name. Fangor looks like he fits in perfectly with the rest of King Hiss's original snake crew, even if he was created years after the original line ended. Not stopping there though, Mr. Jimenez also designed another fan favorite snake man, sorry, snake woman, Lady Slither giving fans something the Snake Man army was missing all these years to match up with other classic female characters in the line like Tila, Evelyn, and Catra. Lady Slither sports a giant serpentine bottom half, which is like the opposite of King Hiss's concept, who sported a giant snake upper body, which was fitting given that she went on to lead the Snake Man herself during Hiss's absence. And finally, we have an odd couple, Lord Grasp and Terror who were originally stated for the original 80s toy line but never saw the light of day due to the line's cancellation in 1988. Originally existing in unused concept art, these two finally saw the light of day as part of an exclusive convention set in 2017. Since they were designed when the line itself was on life support, cost-cutting was being heavily employed to keep things running. Thus, we basically have two Frankenstein characters made out of previous figure parts. Lord Grasp basically had Squeeze's head paired with Clawful's claw and topped off with what looked like to be Scareglow's cape, while Terror took things to another level sporting Rattler's extended neck and tail with Whiplash's head, Trapjaw's weapon arm and Mosquito's boots. At least this scaly monstrosity was later explained to be an alien shapeshifter who aside from being able to unleash a terrifying supersonic scream could mimic the powers and forms of other masters. Think Super Skrull or Super Adaptoid. Alien or not though, King Hiss saw this guy's potential and quickly had Lord Grasp recruit him into the Snake Man army. And that should cover all the unique Snake Man characters currently in existence. Yes, there are a good number of other Jimenez designed Snake Men that currently exist as concept art online. But until any of them get immortalized in plastic form and receive more fleshed out backstories, I'll just leave it at that. As I mentioned at the start of this episode, snake-related villains were pretty commonplace in 80s cartoons. So King Hiss and the Snake Men don't really get any points for originality. However, for me, they do shine in execution and the way they were portrayed. They have a rather extensive story firmly entrenched in the Masters of the Universe lore and have rightfully earned their place as one of He-Man's deadliest foes. So who is your favorite Snake Man? Let me know in the comments below and tell me your story. Thanks for watching Stories from the Toy Shelf. If you enjoyed this story, why not check another one? And please help me out by giving me a like or comment, and subscribe to the channel to get notifications whenever I upload a new story. Until the next one!